Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode 22 of This Week in FCPA for the week ending September 16th, 2016. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Jay Rosen, Mr. Translations himself. In this episode, Jay and I take a look at the <clears throat> SEC FCPA settlement with Chun Ping Zhang, <clears throat> the former head of the uh, Harris Corporation China Business Unit. We take a look at reports that Tilia has been uh, received a demand from the Department of Justice and Dutch prosecutors for $1.4 billion to settle the Vimplecom related enforcement actions. And <clears throat> we look at the ongoing FCPA, excuse me, F, uh, FIFA. Uh, investigation on Sepp Blatter and two deputies who paid themselves $81 million in pay and bonuses. And we take an extended look at the Wells Fargo enforcement action regarding its 2 million fake accounts and what it means from the top to the bottom of the organization. Jay reports on the GIR uh, dinner and conference in New York City and of course previews his weekend report. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to This Week in FCPA. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, episode 22 for the week ending September 16th, 2016. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Jay Rosen. Jay has switched coasts on us, and where are you today, Jay? Uh, I am speaking to you from the Big Apple, uh, New York City, where it's... Uh, Beautiful fall day, not humid, the sun's out, and uh, I wish every day could be like this in New York. You know, it's uh, just like Houston. So uh, lovely, lovely. So, Jay, we had uh, kind of an interesting week, I thought, not only from the FCPA perspective, but really from the greater compliance and ethics perspective. And since this is this week in FCPA and compliance and ethics comings and goings for the week, we've got some really interesting kind of compliance and ethics uh, things to talk about. But uh, let me start off with uh, a couple of uh, pure FCPA matters. Uh, the first one was we had a Securities and Exchange Commission civil enforcement action against an individual, one Jun Ping Zhang, who was formerly associated with Harris Corp through their uh, Chinese subsidiary, uh, CareFX. And he was uh, Care, CareFX Corporation. So he was uh, basically their China business unit manager. Harris Corp is a tech company that um, helped companies put uh, medical records in um, computerized format. And... Uh, they bought uh, this company, Carefax, uh, which was a U.S. company and had a Chinese subsidiary. And originally it was a software development uh, enterprise, but then it moved to a more commercial sales enterprise. And unfortunately for Harris Corp, Carefax uh, engaged in widespread bribery and corruption, Carefax China, engaged in uh, widespread bribery and corruption to sell its products. So that's really not, unfortunately, anything new. We've, we've seen that before. There were approximately uh, somewhere between uh, uh, 200,000 to a million in improper gifts to Chinese government officials and uh, officials at state-owned hospitals and regional departments of health. The Basically, the sales scheme was that the China business unit, Carefax China, would submit bogus expense receipts labeled as entertainment, office expenses, or transportation to the accounting department. The individual who was named in the enforcement action would approve them, or in some cases, uh, he had granted a blanket approval for all such expenses, and that's how they generated their money to uh, fund the bribe. So obviously, follow the money. But Jay, the, the thing that was of uh, greater note of or of greater interest, I thought, for the FCPA compliance practitioner was that Harris Corporation bought Care FX, and apparently they performed little to no due diligence on the Chinese business unit. 
and the Chinese business unit was dissolved and folded directly into Harris Corp. So we had the situation where the acquired company, formerly them, who was engaging in bribery and corruption, became us. And now we are engaging in bribery and corruption. And so uh, it really pointed to me the need to engage in very robust pre-acquisition due diligence. And if you don't engage in pre-acquisition due diligence, or you cannot, you have to have an accelerated time frame to engage in post-acquisition uh, 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 forensic investigation around FCPA issues. The um, sales revenue was relatively low. I think uh, it was uh, 1% of Harris Corp's uh, total revenues. So obviously not I would say not material, but unfortunately there's no materiality under the FCPA, but a huge lesson in if uh, somebody's engaging in bribery and corruption before you buy them and they continue to do so after you buy them, it's not them, it's you, and now you're liable for it. So uh, from uh, your pers- what did you see kind of from your perspective? Um, you know, uh, I think this one's uh, pretty clear cut. Uh, we have been talking about due diligence for a very long time. So, um, you know, uh, successor liability is always something that's there from an FCPA perspective. And I, I think you were quoting, you had a conversation with Matt Ellis a couple of weeks ago, and he said that he's seeing an increase with a lot of uh, due diligence that's being done with private equity companies and with potential acquisitions. So uh, I think the word is, is finally starting to get out here. Um, this matter dates back from 2012. So, uh, you know, hopefully we don't have to mention these things until we're blue in the face. But I I think larger transactions, especially with GE's acquisition of all STEM and them, you know, trying to clean things up before they actually became the owner. So um, I, I would say that most, if any uh, practitioner out there uh, isn't performing uh, due diligence uh, from an ethics compliance and an FCPA perspective, uh, it, it's really inexcusable at this point. Well, and I guess the other point that I'd like to, to emphasize, Jay, and the thing that I try to emphasize when I speak to corporations is whatever uh, Harris is, uh, and Harris Corporation has not been charged, there's been no enforcement action. We don't know the resolution of that, if, if, if any. But uh, even if there is an enforcement action, whatever the fine and penalty will be, would be, will be much less than the business cost. And I say that because obviously there was an investigation uh, and Harris turned up these facts and turned them over to the government. But Harris ended up having to fold up this entire business unit and they sold the outward facing assets, whatever that might mean. But um, they, they, you know, they had to close down their China operation uh, that they obtained from uh, CareFX. So that demonstrates the business cost when you don't perform adequate due diligence. And I've had clients who uh, engage in acquisitions of companies that they performed a due diligence on, but uh, there was either a JV or a business unit in you name the corrupt country, and they could not get that JV or business unit cleaned up. And they ended up having to write off that part of the transaction. And that's a significant cost, and it's going to go directly to your bottom line. So um, there's really a business reason to do this. And when the the DOJ and SEC actually said that in the FCPA guidance, and they say that at conferences, and I think that's uh, as powerful a message as the cost of a fine or a penalty. So um, there's really a good business reason to know who you're about to buy or who you're about to buy go into a joint venture with, and that business reason is if they're engaging in uh, bribery and corruption, you're going to be potentially liable for the criminal or civil sanctions, but there's going to be a large business cost. And uh, the other cost is, of course, you can't utilize those contracts. You can't book that revenue that was engaged in, uh, revenue that was obtained through bribery and corruption. So lots of business problems for failing to do either adequate due diligence on the pre-acquisition side or um, a, a ramped up, highly speeded up, as in the Halliburton uh, 0802 opinion release, post-acquisition due diligence and forensic audit of the um, 
target companies' uh, business operations in uh, regions which are perceived to be corrupt. So I think some 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 pretty serious lessons here, and uh, you know, I think we're going to have to continue to say it, uh, not till we're blue in the face, because um, it's a it's a business. It's a business loss. And uh, when, when people like you and I can point out reasons, reasonable steps companies should take that not only protect them legally, but make them stronger from the business side, I think that's exactly what um, a business solution is to a legal problem like the FCPA. So uh, I, I'm talking myself into believing this is a powerful case, but it's certainly a powerful case for teaching points. Yeah, agreed. And and it's bad enough anytime you do an acquisition when you have to write down the goodwill. But in these extreme situations, we're talking about writing off 100% of the goodwill and then penalties. uh, And then, as you said, they're not going to be able to book any of that revenue because it's ill-gotten gains. Right. So uh, let's uh, we'll have to see uh, where Harris Corporation itself shakes out. in any potential fine or penalty uh, that'll be interesting to watch going forward, but certainly interesting to see an individual enforcement action with this type of information. Uh, Jay, next up we have our friends. That's the friends who are always there, always around, always back when you need an example of what not to do in the field of compliance (laughs) and ethics. We have our good friends at FIFA and, um, this is a continuation of a case or, or, or a continuation of a FIFA matter that popped up earlier this summer. But it turned out that um, in his last couple of years of his reign, Sepp Blatter, his former uh, Secretary General Jerome Valky, and the former Finance Director Marcus Katner had generously awarded themselves some $81 million in compensation. And um, they had uh, awarded themselves other incentives along the lines of they couldn't be uh, prosecuted for this, which is always interesting when you write into a civil contract that you won't be prosecuted for stealing money. Nevertheless, uh, FIFA, in its after having announced this several months ago, in its infinite wisdom, has said it is opening formal proceedings against Blatt, Valky, and Katner over this uh, awards, uh, bonus awards. So um, I'm not quite sure whether that says more about FIFA or the three executives, but uh, I guess um, opening a formal investigation is about as strong as, as FIFA goes. Gambling in Casablanca? Say it's not true, Rick. I, I know you're shocked, shocked. Shocked. But, uh, you know, perhaps that's the answer. Maybe uh, Inspector Renault. Uh, in addition to being shocked, perhaps the next step should have been to open an investigation uh, into the gam- alleged gambling in Casablanca. Yeah. So uh, you got you know, to see what's under the piano, right? Yeah, got to see what's <laughs> under the piano. So uh, it's good that we can uh, slot in our classic movie uh, reference for the week. Uh, I did forget to uh, start off with four and O with Garoppolo, Go Patriots. <laughs> Great win at Denver to open the season. So. All right. So here's here's my little let's let's digress for three minutes. Here's my little rap that I've been telling people here in New York City. Uh, say the Patriots go four and zero under Garoppolo. Does Mr. Belichick and Bill we trust tell Tom we'd love to have you out there, but Garoppolo has the hot hand, and we're going to stick with him. What do you think the percentage chance of that happening is? Uh, below zero. Okay, so the next question people say is, well, it doesn't really look like Belichick was complicit in the alleged events of Deflate Gate because he pretty quickly distanced himself from Brady. So could there be a possible schism there? And with Belichick being as mercurial and tight-lipped as he is, could he, in my scenario, and you say it's less than 0% chance, could he ride uh, Garoppolo into the fifth game? So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to still be contrarian and, and just put that out there. So uh, hopefully you'll tell me I'm wrong against Cleveland in Week 5. 4-0 and oh with Garoppolo, but it ends there. We go back to my main Michigan man, Tom the Golden Boy Brady. 
and we're looking at, uh, according to some prognosticators, a New York Giants Patriots rematch number three. So uh, maybe Brady can finally uh, knock off Eli. Nevertheless, uh, big win. Congratulations. So uh, thank you, and uh, we play Houston what uh, next Thursday? A week, a uh, week from yesterday. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. So um, let's uh, talk about stagecoaches. What, what do you got that's good or not so good from Wells Fargo? Well, I don't think we can say good uh, at all around. Uh, this is going to be one of the great uh, scandals of certainly this second half of uh, this year. Uh, Congress has now indicated they're opening uh, investigation. The DOJ has indicated they're now opening a criminal investigation. But for those who have not seen the newspaper or heard the news, Wells Fargo had agreed to a $185 million settlement for basically uh, uh, churning accounts. So what they were doing is they were cross-selling different products and services to customers who either didn't need them, didn't want them, or in many cases didn't even know that they had been assigned these services, such as credit cards, debit cards, uh, other banking, commercial banking services that Wells Fargo made. The um, Wells Fargo itself had set up an incentive sales program for its employees to cross-sell, and cross-sell they did. Uh, unfortunately, uh, like I said, many of these people didn't need these services, but there's a large number of these people who didn't even know that these accounts had been opened. And I'm not talking a couple of accounts. I'm talking two million to the point where over 5,300 people were fired by Wells Fargo, fully 2% of the workforce. And it was just, uh, you know, a huge, huge, huge scandal and problem. But it really doesn't end there because it really gets better. Uh, and the better was yesterday in an interview with the Wall Street Journal, the CEO of Wells Fargo said, you know, it was just bad employees. It, it's not a senior management. I, I didn't tell anybody to break the law. I didn't know anything about this. Gosh, how can we keep people from breaking the law? It's just bad employees. Well, buckaroo, uh, captain of the ship, the, it's all the buck stops with you, but more importantly, where were the internal controls around this? You opened 2 million accounts and nobody thought to see, well, gosh, uh, are they being opened and closed? Is it essentially a stockbroker churning the account? Uh, did uh, Are there consents in the file for people to have opened these accounts? Where are the internal controls? Where was the compliance function in all this? Were they over there looking at the anti-money laundering laws and not paying attention to internal sales? Uh, this is just preposterous for him to say that and to try to put the blame on lower level employees when somebody at management set those incentives. Uh, someone in HR set those incentives, finance, wherever it is, somebody set those incentives. And apparently no one from senior management was terminated over this. Um, the person who is the head of the commercial banking retired this summer with uh, payments of reportedly between $7 million to $124 million. I recognize that's a pretty wide range of reported payments, so I'm not sure where hers may shake out, but no clawbacks have been announced. Uh, no real changes that uh, we've seen to Wells Fargo internal controls, structure. Um, the CEO finally has said that he is sorry, that that's not the values of the bank. But, uh, I mean, this, this one is if there was ever a myth of the rogue employee uh, sitting over stealing money from corporations to pay bribes or to engage in other nefarious conduct. Uh, this scandal clearly shows how not only tone from the top matters, but it's a compliance program has to be designed to prevent and detect illegal conduct. And you prevent uh, largely through internal controls and training. You detect through internal controls and internal audit. So that's why, and then you remediate. And that's why apparently none of this was done by Wells Fargo. Yeah, it appears that Mr., how do you say his name? Stumpf? Stumpf, I guess. CEO Stumpf. Yeah, he, it looks like he's taken a, play, a playbook right out of the uh, Volkswagen um, you know, publicity uh, uh, campaign on what not to do in a crisis. Uh, there is, I'm reading some stuff uh, up on my screen because I'm in New York, so i got to read the New York Post, right? And it says here, um, 
uh, I bitched about it to the point where I was miserable and disillusioned, said former WF wrote. No one cared to fix the problems. The final straw was knowing I was doing stuff the right way and could never match the numbers of the people that were doing stuff the wrong way and got promoted past me. So, uh, you know, to your point earlier, I, I think uh, there there is no rogue employee. There's roughly 5,300 employees associated with this scam. And not only does this guy get knocked, but uh, you can pretty much uh, be sure that there's going to be a shareholder's lawsuit to get the claw back uh, from the uh, individual who spearheaded all this. Well, um, that's going to be interesting to see if that remedy can be affected from the civil side. But uh, I guess I was just stunned that the CEO would stand up and say, it's not management. Uh, we didn't tell anybody to break the law. And this is the largest financial institution in the United States. So um, uh, when the Republican Congress thinks your conduct is so bad, they want to investigate you, um, that uh, really says something. And if there was ever a movement to reduce uh, the jurisdiction or effectiveness of the, the Consumer Protection Finance Bureau, uh, CPFB, um, I think that has ended with uh, this scandal from Wells Fargo, which was not in the corporate uh, uh, clients, but in the commercial sector for people like you and me opening an account. So um, I think we're going to have a lot of ripples and waves uh, from this. So I got another anecdote that's not uh, ethics and compliance related, but it's similar. Uh, I recently bought something on Amazon and, you know, did it through our prime account. When I checked out, they sold me something that I didn't want, which is some subscription to Audible or something like that. And, you know, luckily I looked at my bank statement the next month and it said AMZN charge and I had to call them up. And uh, it was something to do with either Audible or, you know, the the prime product in the, in the free music. But if I didn't catch that, um, it, it's almost the same deal that there was some kind of fine print that when you made a purchase, they decided that you wanted this project uh, product as well. Whether you said you wanted it or not. No, and you know, you call back and you uh, would complain and they'd gladly take it off, but how many people are calling back and complaining and how many people even know the charge is showing up on their account? Exactly. So Jay, we had one other, I thought, uh, tidbit of tantalizing news in the FCPA space, which uh, may portend something uh, quite dramatic let down the road. And that was the uh, Swedish telecom company Telia announced that it had received, quote, a proposal from U.S. and Dutch authorities to pay $1.4 billion, as in the B word, to settle allegations of overseas bribery. And the overseas bribery is Telia's ownership of Vimpelcom. Now, Vimpelcom had previously paid $795 million to both U.S. and Dutch uh, officials. Uh, for bribing of Uzbek, um, Uzbekistan uh, telecom officials and for payment of bribes to the uh, daughter of the then president, um, Gulnara Karamova. Uh, her father died uh, within the past couple of weeks. So um, if this penalty goes through, it would be the second highest combined penalty. Siemens, of course, is uh, 1.6 billion. That's 800 to the U.S. and 800 to Germany. But um, it will be interesting to see where this uh, shakes out. One thing I would observe, Jay, is that it never, ever, as in never, uh, benefits a company to negotiate in public with the DOJ. Um, so um, I, I don't know what your thoughts on that might be. You know, perhaps 4-0 with Garoppolo, you have different thoughts on those things. The, and obviously the nefariousness of the entire corrupt Boston Patriot or New England Patriots football team, you may feel differently. Nevertheless, um, uh, I found it very uh, disconcerting for Telia and its shareholders that they're negotiating in public. Yeah, I, I think if you look back to what was it, was it last summer when um, Avon was Avon. negotiating? And they said, um, hey, DOJ, how about we uh, wrap things up here for $12 million? Yeah. Not 
<laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> so uh, the reason why I am in New York for the past couple days is I came out to attend uh, the Global Investigation Review Live Conference and award ceremony. And uh, just uh, I don't want to uh, give up all the goods now, but I'm gonna have a brief uh, overview of the event. Uh, in my weekend uh, wrap-up, but it was um, an interesting um, concept because it was uh, like a half a day conference, so it went from uh, 8.30 in the morning until 2 p.m. and there was a working lunch. Uh, ben Morgan was there from the SFO office and the uh, big news is he gave the American uh, FCPA bar and uh, American authorities an A minus for how nicely they play with the uh, SFO, so that was uh, good to hear, and uh, it was a nice mix of people from companies, uh, people from the government, and then uh, uh, ex prosecutors who are now in the private bar. And in the evening last night, they revealed a list of the uh, top 30 uh, FCPA practices uh, here in America. Uh, they really stressed that it wasn't uh, anything to do with what rank you had, but as long as you were in the top 30, it meant that you were one of the preeminent practitioners. And then uh, it was very nice at the end of the evening, they gave um, a Lifetime Achievement Award to Dan Newcomb from Sherman and Sterling, and he uh, very eloquently reflected back uh, again to the beginnings of our profession in, in the wake of the uh, Watergate trials, and uh, that he and um, you know a few other people were there in early days. So um, it was a nice event put on by GIR, and uh, I will go into it a little bit more on my weekend wrap up. Will you be able to link to the uh, listing of the top uh, firms and practitioners? Unfortunately, that is behind the, the firewall. Uh, GIR is a subscription-based um, uh, service. I'm going to try reaching out to the folks that I spoke to and see if they might um, allow me. Uh, you know, I can, I can roughly remember who those top 30 are, and uh, I know definitely who number one and number two are. So I'm going to try to negotiate that during the day and see if I can get that uh, out on the weekend read. What else? Uh, do you have? Uh, could you give us a little, uh, little teaser on the rest of your uh, weekend uh, review? Uh, this is, I'm going to try something new. I think uh, the past couple weeks I've gotten a little bit uh, off track and, and, and put, in, put a little bit too much in. So I'm going to try to go with the, the less is more approach and um, I'll see what else strikes me on the airplane tonight when I'm flying back. Well, um, that's too bad because I really like the, the longer format. <laughs> so uh, there's one vote contra. So uh Jay, you and I are going to actually be in Chicago together in about 10 days now. And I would like to, uh, to ask um, the audience the following. Uh, if you've been reading my blog this week, you know I wrote about passion and the compliance practice, why the compliance practice is meaningful for you. And what I'm going to try to do, Jay, at the SCCE, uh, Compliance and Ethics Institute uh, in Chicago from the 25th to the 28th of September is – uh, get people to tell me why they're passionate about compliance or why they find working in the compliance field meaningful. So if you're listening to this, uh, if you would um, make a note, either shoot me an email and uh, we can uh, get together and have a cup of coffee or just uh, make a mental note to uh, take me aside. I'm going to have my uh, handy dandy iPhone and uh, mic with me. Doesn't have to be long or elaborate, just a couple of lines. I've already had a couple of folks email me this morning with uh, why. Uh, they find uh, working in compliance so uh, meaningful, but I really think I've uh, struck something here, and uh, I'd really like to get some other folks' uh, views on on why they find it so meaningful. So, Jay, uh, it's going to be uh, – who are the Patriots playing this weekend? Uh, they are playing the Miami Dolphins. Okay, and well, I'm going to have to chalk that one up as a W. Okay. And uh, the Texans uh, have a rematch with Kansas City who stomped on uh, the Texans' neck uh, last year in the playoffs, 30 to zip. So uh, hopefully the Texans will show up this time. Uh, frankly, I don't know who the Cowboys are playing up, giving up. So uh, but hopefully there'll be a, uh, 
a good weekend of uh, pro football. College football started off last night with the U of H with a big win over the University of Cincinnati. So uh, it should be a lot of fun this weekend. And I look forward to your weekend report. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you next week, Jay. Great. Thanks, Tom. And as always, thank you to everyone out there and the Internet. And thank you for allowing us to tell you about the FCPA week that was.